So I would like to introduce you to Len, who has kind of become a little bit famous. Um, he's one of our proof of concept, um, the people we picked up in proof of concept. And what we did is similar to that journey map you've got, where, but try to take it up a couple of levels and we don't want all that detail, we just want to capture in essence what's gone on with him. So what we have here is where the demand came in, which is the pink bit. And then what we've done is we've plotted what would have happened to Len if I'd gone and seen him before I came into this team. So as I said earlier, occupational therapist would have said before, a very good one, yeah. not to blow my own trumpet too much, <laughs> bloody good as it I am, I thought. Um, so this is what would have happened to him then. And then what we've tried, what we've done is we've captured what we've done differently this time. So I'm going to talk you through that. So, um, so the referral came in from Devon Partnership Trust. It was a referral from a case manager saying that they were working with Len who was having problems with bathing, bed transfers, chair transfers and mobility. That referral was made to Care Direct North who rang him back because that's part of their process. They had a conversation with Len and he said, I'm moving to Bristol. And they said, okay, all right, but I understand you've got some problems with, your care manager said you're struggling with getting in and out of the bath. No, it's not a problem. I can do that. Okay, getting in and out of bed. Oh no, I can do that. Oh, that's all right. Your chair. Oh yeah, that's a bit of a problem. And that your walking's a challenge. Yep, that, that's true. That My walking's a bit of a worry to me. Okay, because there's mobility as part of this, that's not part of CDP North's remit. So that goes to the community rehab team because we've got mobility as part of that. So it's at this point that we've intercepted that journey. So what would have happened is, if I'd have received this in my old team, he would have, I would have triaged the referral and he probably would have waited nine to 12 weeks to be seen. At that point, I would have rung him and he probably would have said, I'm moving to Bristol, because he said that here. And I would have gone, brilliant. <laughs> Really? How wonderful for you. Have a wonderful time in Bristol. Um, contact the OTs when you get there. They'll come out and they'll sort out any, any problems you've got. If I'd been a little bit more compassionate that day and, and gone with the, okay, that's fine. Um, is there anything I can do in the meantime? Which I kind of like to think I would have done. Um, I would have gone out to see him. So if he'd have said I'm moving to Bristol, possible discharge, move on to the next person. Or I'd have gone out and seen him at home. Going out to see him at home, Currently what happens in system is I have a wedge of assessments that I have to fill out. And they aren't OT specific. They are just, they are just <laughs> the ones that the current system asks me to capture. So that's things around, we have a core therapy and a nursing assessment. We have an A and a B, because apparently one's not enough. We have, I would have checked all these medications across with what the GP had given him. I would have done an ND frat because there's a potential falls risk. That's one of our um, falls assessments. I would have checked all these conditions and diagnosis and made sure that they were on our electronic system. I would have captured all this social information. Where does he live? Why does he live there? And then I would have done a physical, a therapy assessment, which is very much focused on physical range of movement and function. That would probably have taken, well, that I would have probably done that in about an hour with him but there was probably about two hours of written work after that. From that assessment, having done those assessments so many times, I predicted that what I probably would have done is referred Len on to a, for a fire safety assessment because he lives in a rented house and I'm always a bit sceptical that the landlords don't follow the fire regs, so I would have got the fire brigade in to, to have a look at that. He wanted his chair raising, so I would have done that. That would have been a referral on to Millbrook, who are, or our retailers, to go out and do the work, which is that line there. I would have also referred him to the voluntary sector, because one of the things he mentioned was um, not having enough money. So benefits check, so that would be that line of work. He mentioned to me that he had problems with hearing and that he had problems cutting his toenails. So I would have signposted him back to his GP to ask about the hearing aid um, for a hearing assessment, but I would have also sent him a lot of information about where he could buy hearing aids, where he could access hearing assessments privately, and about where he could get chiropody privately. What we've done is we've calculated all this in kind of how long that takes. 
So like two weeks between me ringing the fire brigade and them going out to do their assessments. We've also captured how long each one of those will, will take. So at the end of, so probably I go out and see Len, spend about an hour with him. A couple of weeks later, I would have rung him back, checked up on him and just said, equipment gone in okay. You've got the information I've sent you yet. Yeah, everything's fine. Anything that hasn't happened, I would make sure he knew where I'd done, where it was up to. And then I probably would have said, okay, lovely, all done. Look at all these great things you've got. We're, we're, we're back to being okay. And I would have referred him, gone back to the GP and just said, I've, I've, Len's been in touch, this is what we've done. So to summarise that, what we will have done for him, so Len will have had 17, uh, 14 assessments, six referrals and one referral, which I've signposted him to. The outcomes for him is that he would have had a raised sofa, he would have had potentially escape plan from the fire brigade for his home, a benefits check and would hopefully either be now receiving his benefits or on the way to receiving the right benefits and he would have had a stack of leaflets. Um, we calculated that would be about 12 hours 20 minutes time on this case and of that 25% was with Len. And I would say that this is quite a common you know um, pattern for the people that I would come across that what his referral for was quite straightforward, so I think it's quite an accurate reflection of what I would do. What I'll do now is take you through what we've done differently this time. So within this group, we're working to principles, which are on here. I'm not gonna read them all for you, but they're up on here for you to look at. But primarily the, the things to pull out is we're focusing on purpose, understanding and what matters and the real problem to solve. Um, and we're trying to work end to end with people. So they're the two just to bring to your attention. So all this happened, because this is what really happened. And my colleague Mark over there rang Len and said, we've had a referral, can we come out and see you? And he said, I'm moving to Bristol. Mark said, oh, okay, that's okay, move to Bristol. I understand that there's a problem with you walking. Why don't I come out and see if there's anything we can do in the meantime? Yeah, please do. So we went out. We were there for about an hour. What we had was a very, what we try and do here is have an understanding conversation. So this goes out the window and we just arrive and we have a conversation with a human. Um, what Len's presentation, he was very chaotic in his thinking. There was a lot of information that he fired at us from all over the place. It wasn't structured like my assessment would have been. And Mark and I both left kind of like, what on earth is the problem to solve there that is just there's just so much to do where do we even start part of our practice as you've already heard is to go back and play back what we've what we've understood we came back and we were like what, what have we understood <laughs> there's just so much um and what we did is we drew a picture and this is probably the third or fourth iteration of our picture what we started to do was just capture the things that leonard said to us and then as we captured it, we were like, oh, there's, there's kind of themes to this. Um, and then that's what we've done here in colour. So the stuff in blue kind of could be associated to a psychological state. The stuff in red is kind of more around um, social issues, uh, lack of social support, lack of funding. The stuff in green is physical problems. And then you've got a couple of other things about um, he struggles with reading, um, he struggles with forms and the fact he wants to move to Bristol. They're kind of on the periphery, but this was the, the, the big things that he came up with. We then took that back to Len and said, this is what we heard you say and showed him it. And he was just like, oh my God, there's loads of stuff there. That, there's a lot. And we were like, yeah, there is a lot. <laughs> there's a really lot. And he was like, well, no wonder my head's a bit oh, all over the place. I was like, yeah, look at all this. What we've managed to do, I said, what we've done is, is we think we found some themes. What, what do you think? Um, and, and he recognised everything on here was what the words he said, with the exception of intrusive thoughts, because that's my language, not his. But the rest of it was all things that he actually told us. And he was like, yeah, that, that, that's all. Yeah, and I can see that they all impact on one another. And we're like, yeah, they do. And he was like, and, I can, and looking at it, you know, where do we start? And he's like, well, I can see that this bit's the bigger bit. And I was like, yeah. He's like, so let's start there. I was like, okay. This bit is around your mental health and your mood. So what I probably should have told you, which I'll tell you now, 
is that the reason Len is in the area is that he was in hospital on the psychiatric units just before Christmas, having tried to take his own life. Before that, he was from out of area. So he was discharged to a rental property in Barnstable. No real connect to connection to this place. What became apparent through my conversation was that Len was really articulate. He could talk about how he was feeling. Although it was very distorted, he talked about the breakup of his marriage with such emotion and such it was really moving, he would well up, he would become tearful, to the extent that I made an assumption that that had been what had preempted his um, attempt on his own life. Transpired he, his marriage had broken up 10 years ago, but he still talked about it like it had happened yesterday. He'd had all these kind of traumas, psychological traumas, he'd lost his business, he'd lost his family in the divorce, and that was 10 years ago before we got to this point of him trying to um, take his life. What, what I, I then said, well, Led, have, you, have you ever had any therapy to help about? Any talking therapy? Conscious that I'm a little bit out of my, my expertise. We're getting to the edges of my expertise now. So off Mark and I trotted up with Len to psych psychiatry outpatients to meet his case manager. And we showed his case manager this and she was like, yeah, I can see that makes sense. The, that seems to, it's not the only problem, but it's a big, let's refer you through for that. The other thing that Len had spoken about, as I've pointed out, is Bristol. I'm moving to Bristol. One of the conversations we had with him is, when he'd talk about Bristol, we were like, okay, so you're not from Barnstable, are you from Bristol? No. Okay, why are you moving to Bristol? I've got a house there, I've got a flat there. I bought it when I got some inheritance and I bought it as an investment and I haven't got anywhere now, so I need to go back to Bristol. We're like, oh, okay, what? Do do you th what's life going to be like in Bristol? Well, well, actually, I don't know anyone. I don't know what the house is like. I don't know if it's going to be suitable for my needs. I don't know. I'm I don't even know where the bus stop is. I, I don't. It's, it, yeah. And we were like, okay. Do you? I have to move to Bristol. That's where I'm going. We were like, okay. Just one of the and we made that visible to his case manager. And when we all sat down to meet, the first thing she said was, you know, like, after the hellos was. Mark and Alicia have mentioned that Bristol might not be a good move for you. And he was like, no, it's not. I'm not moving there now. <laughs> Me and Mark were like... Um, he's like, no, I'm selling that. I'm selling the flat. I'm staying in Barnstable. Barnstable's the right place for me to be. Um, I've got, you know, I'm getting a life together here. So what we did um, is we agreed that the case manager would refer him on to talk therapy. And from our point of view, all we've done is kept a relationship open with him. So I text him every couple of weeks just to check in, see how things are going. Some, that has led to another visit because his mood had dropped um, and he hadn't rung his case manager, but he'd spoken to me. So I went back out again. Um, but he's now, he's still on the waiting list for talk therapy because that's about 20 weeks. Um, the house, the flat in Bristol is on the market and he's starting to look for properties here. Um, so if we summarise our input like we have done before, Len's had one assessment, one referral, he's met three people. That's quite important for Len because of his, men well not because of his mental health background, but one of the things that he seemed to think he had to do was tell everybody his story when he met them. So when we went in, what we got was that all disjointed and all over the place, but we got the fact he tried to kill himself, the fact that he'd, he now couldn't drive and how all that had impacted on him. But he also found it quite distressing telling people he got to the point where he wanted to take his own life. So to meet 11 people and feel that you've got to repeat that story, I think quite significant. Um, so his outcomes in the way we're working now is he's not moving to Bristol. He's had a referral to talk therapy and we're just built, keeping an ongoing relationship with him. At the point of the w we did this piece of work, we'd, it had been six and a half hours that we'd spent with Len and out of that 80% had been with him. And he's, what matters, because that's one of the things we're looking for, is he wants to connect with people.
remarks about I speak very passionately about how, how holistic I was, realising how much of my behaviour is driven by the system and by our assessment documentation. And if you'd have asked me, did I have an understanding conversation 12 months ago, I would have said yes. Mm. I would have said yes wholeheartedly. Mm. I would have said, don't you dare tell me I do not have an understanding. I know my patients. I know I'm, I'm an occupational therapist. Don't tell me I don't know who they are. It's only through this learning that I'm starting to see that I've only ever been able to be as holistic as the box I'm in allows me to be. I'm only ever allowed to follow things that the, the system allows me to. And although I could patter that off in a conversation, so you think we're having a conversation, it's still really an assessment. And the stuff that dry, that's in that drives so much. All this work that I thought was really valuable is driven from filling out those boxes. Then none of it's the stuff that he actually says he wants to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than a changing practice, it's changing thinking, yeah. because we think we're doing it already. And I think that's the message that we've had from everybody that we've connected with, or all of us. I mean, we haven't shared our personal stories yet, but a common theme to hearing people that are connected to this is that they think they're already doing it. Yeah. They can see that the system's a problem, but they don't see that that's driving their behaviour and their thinking. Um, so it's, I think the thing is, how do you change your thinking? which I think we're still learning. Um, so it's, you're doing it what I haven't done, and if you audited this against the current system, yeah. I, oh, I'd be in every red box there is, yeah. because I'm audited against these. That's partly why I have to fill them out, because that's what, the, that's what we're measured against. And, and the audits are to reassure managers like me that everything's okay and is safe. And, and it's really hard to, uh, I still, I mean, even this morning I was sat here thinking, Oh, that's making me feel just a bit anxious because one, one of the system conditions that was coming out of one of the cases I was David, that we were, we were unpacking was about a process that I've put in place in the past and it was really like, actually, we could just talk to each other about this. We don't really need to have a whole assessment and write it down and, and mm -hmm. go to the referral. You know, there'd be like six steps and somebody else involved in it and all of that.